Well, hello everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. My name is Jason Levine, and thank you so much for joining me today on the Friday Masterclass, where today we're going to be talking about one of my favorite things, audio. And specifically, I'm going to be um, showcasing a couple of features that very recently uh, have been coming up a lot. We've been doing a lot of work on Reddit. I've been on Reddit a lot. If you're in the Premiere uh, subreddit there, I've been doing a lot of sort of questions and posing larger ideas over there on, on Reddit for the Premiere uh, community. And uh, a couple of these workflows have come up recently regarding uh, auto-ducking, but specifically not using the Essential Sound auto-duck, but doing the more classic sidechain ducking. So we're going to do that in Audition, as well as how to automate specific parameters on an audio file, as well as setting up buses for things like reverb and ambience. And then, um, what else did I want to do also? Oh, and then uh, also showcase a little bit of Adobe Podcast Enhance. Now, I've shown this here on Masterclass before. Uh, it's just one of these things that it's just, it's just awesome. And if you haven't tried it yet, you don't even have to, all you have to do is log in with your Adobe ID to be able to use this service right now. And they made improvements to it. It's incredible, and it's particularly incredible if you have audio that was recorded sort of on axis, but maybe it's too far away, or maybe it was a little noisy, or maybe it wasn't fantastic, or it wasn't you know mic'd properly, or even with a mic. I'm going to show you an example uh, directly from an iPhone where I'm about 12 feet back, kind of outside, and you'll see what it can do very, very quickly. Super awesome. So in any case, thank you so much for joining. As always, we're coming to you live across Adobe Live, Behance, uh, Twitter, YouTube and LinkedIn today. So thank you so much for joining. A couple of quick shout outs here. See, we've got Umicorn, Oliver, Michael, Sam, Gino, Marbella. How are you doing? Great to see you all. Let's see what we've got over here as well. Esteban, how's it going? Jason Kalem, Patrick Devlin, Federico, yes to crypto. Thank you so much. Love your premiere vids. Gino from Brussels, great to see you. Nice shirt today, Esteban says. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I, I'm not like, uh, I had my tie-dye period in college, but I, I don't know. I don't even know. I think I've said before in the stream, I have no idea where this shirt came from. It just appeared one day, and it seems to go with my lighting concept here, so um, it's all good. Uh, anyway, well, thank you all for joining. Oh, Samba is asking, why so, why so scruffy? I, uh, yeah, I ran out of razors some time ago, and, you know, it's not, I don't shave off, and I just trim it up, and when I don't trim it up, it just starts to look messy, but uh, I'll have to trim it up before this weekend for uh, Mother's Day, whatever. Anyway, okay, so let's go ahead and get into it, and I'll try and answer your uh, your cues along the way. And we're going to start in Audition, and uh, let's start with doing buses, uh, automation, and specifically the high-pass filter sweep effect. This has come up a couple times this week in Reddit. Actually, this was in this was in some of the audio subreddits uh, and one of the mixing subreddits, but it also came up in the audition one. I think the user was posting it in multiple places. Um, and these are just sort of standard things that you need to know. So, real simple. I, I, I was going to have a whole you know session for you prepared. Meh, not going to do that. Oh, by the way, this is also an AMA. So if you have additional audio questions as I'm going through some of this, please feel free to ask. I've got about three or four things prepared, and then we're just going to wing the rest. But in any case, uh, this is in fact a theme that I'm putting together. I haven't, uh, I've written it in my head. I just haven't had time to, to perform it yet. And I decided to go with an old classic. You could probably see it in the, in the name of the track there, but um, this may sound familiar to some of you, this particular synthesizer, circa 1981, and it sounds like this. So again, you can read it on screen, but if anybody knows what that is, you know, extra points for me. What's up, Sin Lagos? <laughs> nice to see you, clever Devlin, sneaky tie-dye. Yes. Ah, <laughs> oh, thanks, Sin. So this is a, uh, a Casio VL Tone handheld monophonic. Actually, I guess it's technically duophonic because you can play a monophonic lead and a monophonic rhythm. Uh, this is the uh, preset Rock 1 and Rock 2. That's going to be the basis of the uh, the rhythmic soundtrack for this thing that I'm composing. It's going to be a lot of fun. I can't, actually can't wait to play it for you when I eventually do it. Maybe that doesn't happen. <laughs> 
Musically lately, I'm playing a lot of drums and I'm playing a lot of piano and I don't want to record anything. You know, you just go through those moments. Okay. So let's just assume we wanted to add some reverb to this or to something else. Now, again, just to point out, typically don't add reverb to drums when they're mixed together because you're adding reverb to things like a kick drum, which might make it too boomy. Not that you can't add reverb to drums, absolutely, but generally when they're mixed with cymbals and everything, you don't want to reverberate everything. This being a little, you know, sort of a beat pattern machine, it's fine. There's also no low end on here, so we don't have to worry about that. If you want to set up a reverb bus, now, you do have the option, of course, to use effects inserts to add reverb, and you can do it right here. Nothing wrong with doing that, except that this is what's called a, uh, a, a send. Essentially, it sends the signal from the track to the reverb and right back here. So you don't have as much control with things that we call pre and post fader sends. That's what we're going to do here using the send controls that you see here. And we have 16 of them in Audition. I think we also have 16 in Premiere. It just gives you a little more control and you can control if you send the signal before the fader or after the fader. Right? And if you send it before the fader, that means that you have complete control over the reverberated sound separate from whatever exists on the fader here. So a couple of different options, we're going to go through those. So let's go ahead and set up that send. All right. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to add a bus. So typically when you use things like reverbs, delays, um, echoes, any, any delay-based effect, you can insert flange, you can insert uh, things like chorus, um, but for things like reverb, best practice, you typically want to put them on a bus and then send things to that bus and then have very easy, accessible control for how much signal you're sending to that bus and where it goes in stereo when sending to that bus. So we need to add a bus first, and we're going to create a stereo bus, despite this being a mono drum track. And you'll see it creates it for us down here below, and it says bus A. All right, so let's just go ahead and we're going to call this verb. All right, so now on the reverb bus, we need to insert a reverb effect. Now, we have five different reverbs. Uh, the one I use most commonly that's native to Audition is the studio reverb. This is, this is just my sort of go-to. It's very fast. It works great in real time. These other ones here, they're OK. They're not. They're not optimized for real time. They're old. They sound good, but they're just, they've never really been optimized for real time use. What does that mean in 2023? Don't use them. I mean, do, whatever, but meh, they sound good. You can probably achieve most of those sounds with Studio Reverb unless you're a complete uh, audio nerd like me, in which case you may want to go to something like the Full Reverb, which actually allows you to remodel environments, actually type in dimensions to recreate specific types of rooms, say like a tiled room for drums or something. So you have a little more control, but you know at the expense of you may have a little bit of a CPU performance hit if you use multiple ones or you know you just never know. In any case, for today, uh, just for the heck of it, I'm going to use um, a Waves plugin here, H Reverb. Again, it doesn't change how this all works. It's just different different strokes for different folks. <laughs> I happen to really like the sound of this one, and there's a couple of neat little presets in here. So once you create the send, or the bus, I should say, send one. Now, currently, we're sending this after the fader. I'm going to show you what pre-fader does in a moment. Here's your send level. It says volume. It should really be level. This is how much of that signal of the drums, the VL tone, you're going to send to the reverb. And then this is an individual pan control because you can pan those drums, say, in the reverb more to the left side. So you kind of get this sort of strange side to side echo thing. The drums being in mono, that can actually be sort of cool and effective. So this is the level sending it to the reverb bus. So I'm going to go ahead and let's just let me wind back and make sure I've got plenty of room here. Let's go ahead and start playback and I'm going to increase the send level and you should start to hear that the reverb is increasing. And in fact, I wasn't going to do it because my hair is looking fab, but heck with it. I will wear my headphones. All right, let's take a listen. All right, so you hear that? Off, on.
Now notice I've got, I'm sending it now to the left up here. So if you're listening in stereo, you're hearing that you're actually getting this kind of cool, sort of split apart drum sound, almost sounds kind of 60s-like. Oh, it's very distorted over here, that's my bad. Uh, in any case, um, this reverb isn't the right sound I want, but you get the idea. So the send level is how much you're sending to the actual bus, and then the pan controls where it exists once sending it to that reverb. So let's just use, um, I want to use like a small, a small, or maybe like a, a warm chamber. That might be pretty good. Okay. And by the way, of course, you have independent control of the reverb output here as well. Right. And you can see here, we're sending more to the left side, right, based on the pan that I have right here. So this is a very effective way to use reverb. And the idea of putting it on a bus and sending to it is that if I have other instruments that I want to put in that same warm chamber environment, I can create a completely separate um, soundscape all in the same environment using one effect. So it's efficient in terms of it's using less CPU, um, but also if you're trying to Again, for like percussive elements, you may want the snare drum and uh, you know a quika or a shaker or something, all sort of using that same in, uh, um, reverberant environment or slightly ambient or tiled roomish kind of environment. Maybe you don't. That's a that's a mixing choice you have to make. But typically, I will put sort of like instruments. If I'm using multiple guitars, I want them both in the same room. Feel. I can pan them separately, I can control where the echoes of those guitars go separately, but I ultimately want them, for me, in the same environment. So using a bus allows you to do that really effectively, okay? And then, of course, you can adjust all of your wet-dry settings, what have you, inside the reverb. And speaking of wet-dry, so again, now, as we talked about at the beginning here, I'm sending this post-fader, okay? Now, let's see, I've got minus 1.8 here. So what does that mean? It means that when I drop the fader of the drums, I'm not hearing any reverb at all. When I increase the fader of the drums, the fader of the, <laughs> the drums and the reverb go together, okay? Now, I've shown this many, many times on a master class. When you use a pre-fader send, what that does is it separates the output of that reverb so that you have separate control. And specifically with things like sound design, now you, you do it in music too, but I think I've shown this example here on the stream a few times where let's say you've got someone running down a hall, running up a hallway, a big cavernous hallway. So when they're super far away, you don't really hear the direct t -t 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 of their feet, you just sort of hear the echo of it and you gradually want to bring in the dry sound of their feet as they get closer to the camera and pull back the wet sound, you do that by using a pre-fader send because then you have separate control of the dry original signal and the wet reverberated signal. Post-fader, wet and dry goes together. <laughs> what is this? It's like I'm, I'm doing front raises. Okay, does that make sense? So if I switch this, to a pre-fader send, and it shows you the little arrow. It's before the fader, and this one, notice the arrow is after the fader. A lot of pointing going on in today's stream. So notice the master, the fader of the drums is down, but I'm still hearing the reverberated signal of the drums. And where this really, again, if we were talking about sort of the, the, the cavernous example, let me go to like a large hall here. Okay, this may be way too much. Let's see. Let's see what this sounds like. And I can increase the wet signal, so this is only wet. Okay, so that's a little lesson on creating a bus, sending to a reverb in this case, but it could be anything. It could be an EQ. It could be a compressor. It could be 
a flange. It could be a delay. It could be any effect you want where you have independent control over the level being sent to that effect here, Indica independent control of the pan, and then you have the option to send it before the fader so that you have independent control over the dry signal and the affected signal, or post fader, where when you move that fader, the drums and the reverb go together. Okay? Super common, very useful, uh, and it's, a, again, it's a more efficient way to, to build sessions. Okay? All right, what's up, Cody Bear? <laughs> the past future sounds better with our far futures modern mixing. Yes. <laughs> Saturday Night Live did a Christmas song with the Casio and Horatio Sands, Jimmy Fallon, Chris Kattan, and Tracy Morgan. Oh, wow. I think I actually remember that. Because Chris Kattan and Tracy, you're going back a long time. That's, that's very cool. Uh, also, by the way, I'm so, yes, I see Gino did it. Gino said it. Um, most famously, that Casio VL tone, that specific is famous from that song, Da Da Da, so which was an earworm in the late 90s, I think. Okay. All right, so that's um, busing for reverb. Okay. So here, now what I'm going to do, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, we don't really need the reverb for that. Uh, I'll leave it. Let me go back to something a little more ear pleasing. I'm going to check the chats too over here. Here we go. Hey, great to see you, man. How are you? Ken Shinneberry, long time no see from Dusseldorf. Great to see you. D5 Banjan, yes. Hello, good to see you. Been reading your posts on the Twitters. Dobai, Studio Reverb or just use third party? Yeah, I mean, well, again, whatever you like. Yes to crypto, you got it too. Da, da, da. Yes, very good. Extra points. Thomas Benner, great to see you as well. Okay. Uh, let me just find a, a slightly more pleasing because that... Uh, that big hall that I chose was not good. Um, let's go back to, I liked the medium, the warm chamber. It was a nice, it was a nice sound. Okay. All right. So now what I'm going to show you is specific to automation and how to use effects automation track automation too. Basically how to do something live while it's playing back and audition will capture all of your movements. Whether you're adjusting parameters in an effect like reverb or you're adjusting faders like we were just doing with the pre-fader, post-fader. Um, or in the case of this particular thing, how to do a filter sweep, which is really common, um, you know, in especially like electronic music production and things. So. To do this, um, all you have to do is know where to find the automation options. So inside of each track, you'll see it says read up here. And if you click on this uh, little uh, menu, you'll see you have your four modes, read, write, latch, and touch. Okay, now by default, it's already in, it's always in read. When you want to start recording your movements, i.e. recording any changes that you make while the mix is playing back, you'll go into write mode, okay? And then after I do that, I'll show you how you can modify uh, the keyframes that are generated when you do that automation. Also in the mixer view, same thing here. And this is the same as if you were doing this in Premiere Pro. You'll find it in the track mixer. Same thing. So you can enable those modes here as well. So what I want to do specifically is I have this um, Manny Marikin EQ. I've shown this many, many times. Again, oops. Uh, again I'm... Uh, I love our native effects, but this particular one for the filter sweep, I have to do here, and I'll, I'll get into the why in a minute. But what I want to do is I want to create, I want to use a low pass filter. And remember, low pass means low passes through and the high is cut, all right? And typically this is used for, well, here, I'll just illustrate. Here's what sweeping a low pass filter sounds like. So the cutoff here is 1.8K. So what that means is, Again, low pass. It's allowing all frequencies, you, know, you can't read that. It's allowing all frequencies from zero to 1800 hertz to pass through. So that's gonna give you something that's um, even sub AM radio sounding for those of you old enough to remember AM radio. So 1800 hertz and below. And then as I sweep the low pass, and I, if you can see the little tool tip showing up here, I'm gradually increasing 
the amount of high frequency I'm allowing to pass through, okay? So this is really common in, uh, I mean, well, shoot, trailers, they use this all the time. I mean, it's a little overdone, but it, it, it has an effect. Here's what that sounds like. I'm just gonna do it manually so you can hear. Okay, so here's, we're only hearing up to 1.8 kilohertz right now. Okay, so that's that, you know, I'm trying to remember. You, yeah, it, this has been around forever, but I, I do remember in sort of the mid, late 90s, you know, when this really started to happen a lot with a lot of like dance music and Britney and everything, you'd always say that, right, explosion. By the way, there's not a lot going on here, so it's a little less dramatic, but you can, you can hear it. You can hear what it's doing. So a lot of times you want to be able to automate that over time. Now, sub, sub little bit of detail here. And for those new to the stream, yes, I give enormous amounts of context and detail always. Why would I not use our native parametric equalizer? Because it too has low pass and high pass filters. Remember, low pass, high cut, high pass, low cut. All right. Why would I not do that? It's the same thing here. And by the way, here, if I turn off the Manny American, now this one, this go, you can, you can go all the way down. Ours actually, in a lot of ways, sounds better. There's a slight problem though. So I'm gonna play this back. Let's go to the beginning here. And that's just fun to do. And you may think, well, cool, you should automate that. Just turn it into write mode and capture all that that you're doing. For whatever reason, the low pass and high pass filters in the parametric equalizer, for which I still don't actually know why, we don't capture automation for those two. For those two. I don't know why. I have no answer. So that is why I'm using the Manny American one, a third party one, because we capture everything. I don't, I don't know why we don't. Um, you'll also notice as I was sweeping through, you're actually hearing some of the stepping, you were hearing like little, little sort of clicks. Maybe that's why we don't allow it to automate because of how whatever, I don't know if it's not, it's not linear phase. I don't know what it's doing, but maybe that's why, I don't know. That is otherwise my favorite, and I always use that native EQ, the parametric, seven, seven part, seven band parametric, five band high-low uh, high pass parametric EQ. I always use it, um, but you can't automate the high pass and low pass filter. To automate the high pass and low pass filter, all we're simply going to do, we're gonna wind back to the beginning. I'm going to go into write mode. I'm hoping that YouTube will chapterize this. Left enough pausing there. I don't think I titled this properly. Ah, well, anyway. I'm gonna hit play, and then I'm going to start to adjust the parameter here, and it's going to capture all the stuff that I'm doing. Here we go. And when I finish doing that, what first thing you're gonna notice is it then goes into touch mode. Now I'm gonna come back to that in a second and explain what that means. But just to showcase to you that what we did was captured, let's wind back to the beginning. Let's hit play and I'm gonna zoom in here and pay attention to the little knob right there. I'll even keep it zoomed in, here we go. No hands. Okay, so again, it captures everything that you do in real time. And what's, you've probably seen this in Premiere, but it works the same in Audition. What if I want to modify some of those, it's basically drawing keyframes as you go through, right? Making those changes. So under the, what we call automation lane, which is accessible by this little uh, triangle twirl down here, 
Now, by default, it's always showing volume. So you want to say show envelopes. What do you want to show the envelope for? Well, let's go into the Manny Marikin EQ. And when you go into the effect that you modified, so again, here you can see all of these parameters, it will capture automation info, which by the way is every parameter of that effect. If you see an asterisk, like you see right here, that's telling me that uh, I've made modifications to that parameter. And that's the automation that I can view on screen. By the way, you can see multiple lanes of automation simultaneously. So if I choose low pass, now you can see exactly what it's done. And if I wind back here, just watch. Again, you can sort of look at two things at once. You'll see exactly what it's doing. OK? And what's also cool is that as I hover over each of the keyframes, it's telling you, in this case, because it's the, uh, the specific frequency, what frequency I was I, I was at, that's terrible uh, English. It tells you the frequency that I, I was present in at that moment in time. So let's say I didn't want it to go all the way up to 20.4 20 uh, hertz, 20.49 20 K right here. You know, I could simply move this down or move it up. Or in this case, you know, maybe this slope was too slow or it wasn't fast enough. Or again, I'm wanting to time the sweep specifically between this range, you know, I could pull this keyframe down right here and I could bring this one in a little closer. And now this sweep is going to happen much faster. Okay. It's no more complicated than that. And as you again, continue to modify other parameters. So let's say, uh, oh, well, but okay, before I go there, touch. So what does touch mean? Okay, so touch mode, what that allows you to do, very, very commonly in, in music. Now, not maybe necessarily with the um, something like this, a filter sweep, but particularly with fader movements. You might want to make just a slight adjustment, like maybe you didn't make it loud enough in that moment, and then it, you brought it back down, so you, you, you went up, say, 8 dB, but you meant to go 9 while it's playing, the automation will play along with you. You can touch the fader or touch adjust a parameter. It will record that change. And then when you're done touching, it will then revert back to wherever it left off. OK, so case in point, let's say I wanted to make a more extreme sweep right here in the middle somewhere. I'm going to see if I can do this. We'll see if I can do this while this is moving. This might be a little hard, but I'm going to try. Here we go. OK. So what you see is, so it was ascending by itself. I ramped it up, and then it went back down to where it left off. Now, you may say, OK, well, what is that? How, how does that duration work? Excellent question person who didn't ask. Um, let's let me show you. Where is that? Is that in data? I think it's in data. No. Effects. I have to remember where these things are. We, we move these things. Okay, here we go. So the amount of time it takes to go back to where you left off is set here under auto match time. Okay, so in this case, I have it set to one second. And then there's two options here, which I, I don't know if this is the default. I forget. I think actually it is. I, I actually normally make this even a little bit longer. No, I think the default is 250. Minimum time interval thinning. Okay, so as you're capturing keyframes, you can imagine, and you've probably seen this in, in Premiere or After Effects from time to time. The problem is when doing motion, you don't want a million keyframes because then if you need to modify them manually, that, that just takes forever. So what you can say is don't capture keyframes that are any less uh, apart from one another. That's any smaller than 350 milliseconds. That what, that's what that means. So it's capturing your motion every third of a second. All right. You can make, I don't know what the largest duration is. Oh, it goes way up there. Okay. So you can, you can determine 
what that is. And obviously, the higher the number, the fewer the keyframes you're going to have. Now, again, depending on what, um, what it is you're doing, you may only want four. You know, you, again, if I'm just doing a filter sweep from low to high, theoretically, I only really want two or three keyframes. I don't need all those steps that you saw there. So I could increase that number. What you probably don't want is, and I think this defaults to 250, but maybe we changed it, or something like 100 milliseconds. So that means every tenth of a second, it's setting a keyframe. You're gonna have, you're gonna have hundreds of unnecessary things. So if you wanted to modify them manually, it's absolutely, it's just, it's not possible. So auto matches, again, when in touch mode, you make a change, how long it takes to go back to where it was originally. I actually will typically set that. One second is sort of, it's, it's, it's musical, but that may be a bit long for some things. So typically I'd say, you know, a quarter of a second to half a second. So like 0.25 is probably a little more ideal. That's definitely a default one second. And then the minimal time interval thinning is, what's the duration I want between keyframe A and keyframe B? The minimum, it has to be at least 350 or at least a second or at least 100. But I, I wouldn't go that low. It will be very frustrating for you. Okay. All right. I see here, uh, so Gino's asking, can you Bezier those keyframes? Great question. Very Adobe centric. I guess everybody Bezier's now. And the answer is yes. So when you right click, control click on a keyframe, you can choose to spline curve it. And now you have smooth Bezier curves, which yes, is no longer linear. And it's gonna sound a little smoother, depending upon what you're doing. Obviously for some things you actually want it a bit more linear but you can see now you have that nice smooth curve. So um, it's really, really nice. It sounds great, very effective. And by the way, that option, it Bezier's everything. So you can't just do like one part of it. If I turn it off, it goes back to the way it was. Okay, if I turn it back on, it's spline. Okay. D5 Banjan, thank you for your valuable retweets. Can, I, can you buy me a coffee? <laughs> You're very kind. Uh, Yes, if I'm ever in your vicinity, by, by all means, sure. Um, although these days I don't really drink much coffee. Okay. Uh, all right, just checking the chats, looks good. Okay, so let's move on here. Filter sweep, automation, busing, side chaining. Okay, so this now, this is um, uh, one of the most commonly asked about things because it's, used everywhere. Side chaining. Hopefully YouTube catches that. And uh, it's the idea, the concept of using, in this case, a compressor where the input of the compressor is a voice. And I have music playing underneath the voice. And what I want to happen is when the voice ha starts talking, the music is compressed down in volume. It's attenuated in volume. So Traditionally, we, we call this a, a side chain duck, where you use a compressor to basically adjust the volume of the music based on the input, which is a voice or a vocal. You do this in music as well. You can also side chain EQ. We do this in music too. So let's say, you know, when the vocal comes in, maybe you want to dip um, some particular frequencies on the guitars or something else, you can use an equalizer and when the voice comes in, you can say, all right, dip everything right in the middle, 1K to 3K. And when it gets the input from that voice, an EQ gets applied to those guitars. Side chaining is super cool. Um, it's very useful. And it's just a manual way to do what we allow you to do for voice and, uh, and music with the essential sound panel. So you've probably seen it in here before. If I were to tag this as music, we have this ducking option here. Okay, and this is, this is perfectly fine. So sensitivity is basically the compression threshold. Duck amount is just that in decibels, how, how much you want it to, you know, to go down in volume. Fade duration is after you're done ducking, or rather once the voice stops, how long does it take for the music to get up to its regular level? This is, again, it's almost a second. That's a little long. And then we have this kind of fade position 
which just it just it's it's basically a smooth a, a transition smoother for when applying the ducking. This was added not so long ago. Um, this is fine. This generates keyframes. It's maybe a little less musical at times, so I wouldn't use this uh, for music mixing. Maybe I would use it for you know just like basic one voice, one music track in Premiere or something like that. But if you want total control, <laughs> which many times you do, sometimes you don't. That's one of the benefits of Essential Sound is that um, you can have control, but basically it's just check boxes and sliders and it does all the work for you. Then you can set this up manually. So I'm going to show you how to set up a manual sidechain duck uh, here in Audition. So this is from, uh, I, I don't know if I ever showed this, so I'm gonna, we're going to talk to Adobe Podcast Enhance in a few minutes. This is from, I did a never to be released TikTok for the team. I, I do not do TikTok. I gave it to them. They were going to post it to TikTok. And I think it was actually when the, when the queen passed away. So we, we were pausing all socials and then that went on for a while and then something else. So it, it just never got put out there, but that's what the voiceover is from. And, uh, let's just take a listen. So this is just basic voice and music. I'm, you get the idea, just basic voice and music. I'm actually going to, uh, I think the levels are just fine. Let's go ahead and play a little bit of this. Hey TikTok, Jason Levine from Adobe here. Let's talk about Project Shasta. So Project Shasta has three specific components. We're going to focus solely on the one called Enhanced Speech. Mm -hmm. So this is when it was still called Project Shasta. So this is like nine, 10 months ago or something. Um, okay. So here's, here's how it works. It's very simple. And again, you can't do this in Audition. I mean, sorry, you can't do this in Premiere. You can only do this in Audition today. Maybe one day we'll see this in Premiere Pro. So on our music track, track two, what I'm first going to do is I'm going to use a compressor. Now, first I'm going to show you with a third party one, just because I think visually it's a little easier to understand. And then I'll show you which of our compressors can also be side chained. Part of why I show this with a third party one is that we support side chaining with third party effects. So that just, again, you know, as someone who still tries to spread a bit of the audition gospel, it's good to know that you, you can use this with, you know, popular effects and take advantage of all they have to offer. So in this case, I'm going to use the um, classic SSL, uh, what we used to call the two mix compressor. I can tell you I've, as I've said many times, I've made easily easily a hundred records on uh, a G or J series implementing this two mix bus compressor during the final mix. I, I mean, in college we had SSL. I, I, yeah, I mean, more than a hundred mixes for sure. It's just great. It's great. It's very warm sounding, it's super analog. It's just fantastic. So I add the compressor to the music track, okay? And then inside of the effect itself, or I should say the effect container, now this is again specific to how Audition does it, you'll see that there's a button up here, set sidechain input. So all I have to do is tell it, right, what, what's the input that's feeding this? So what's going to trigger this compressor? And in this case, it's going to be the mono voice signal. So I'm going to say mono. And once this goes yellow, odd choice for UI, but it is what it is. Now, this is going to be triggered by a my voice track, but it's just waiting for a mono signal. Actually, right now, it doesn't know that it's the voice track. It, it could be anything. It's just looking for a mono input. So once I've done that, now we're going to go to our send again. So this is where, remember, we set up a bus. Well, when you enable side chaining on an effect, Instead of creating a bus, we're going to go to that same flyout menu here. So this is where we can add bus. But notice now it says sidechain. And now I can tell it use in slot one the SSL compressor, which is on the music track. OK? So all I have to do now is enable that. And then once I do that, again, you'll see you have your volume, although this is, again, technically send level, and a pan, which you most likely don't want to mess with. Um, I'm just going to leave it at the zero nominal value. But just as before, where this send controls how much is going to the effect, it works the same way here. OK? So with that in play, and here maybe I can, let me do a little 
side by side by side. What did I what did I just do there? Oh no, I, I did it in the wrong place. Hold on, I'm trying to get. I just want these to be. There we go. Okay. So without adjusting anything, let's let's see what this sounds like. I'm guessing I may have to adjust the threshold a little bit here. It's probably a little high. Uh, it's probably not gonna uh, be dropping it enough. It's not gonna be hitting the signal enough. And that release might be a little. I don't know about auto for this, but let's let's take a listen. <laughs> Hey TikTok, Jason Levine from Adobe here. Let's talk about Project Shasta. So Project Shasta has three specific components. We're gonna focus solely on the one called Enhanced Speech. And the idea behind this is maybe you don't have the best sounding mic, or maybe you're not in the best environment. So whether you're recording from one of these, or recording with one of these, or even recording with one of these. What it? <laughs> yes, that's a very old microphone. This is from the 1970s. But, but it works. works! Project Shasta can turn that into something that sounds like it was recorded in a studio. Okay, so that release time is too long. But you hear as I was adjusting the threshold here, that music was going down. So I'm gonna set the release to around 1.2. Okay, you have no makeup gain. Let's wind it back. And when those guitars come crashing in, right when I start talking, you should hear it just start to boom, go down nice and smoothly. Let's take a listen. <laughs> Hey TikTok, Jason Levine from Adobe here. Let's talk about Project Shasta. So Project Shasta has three specific components. We're gonna focus solely on the one called Enhanced Speech. All right, and and now, the idea behind this is... Let's hear how those uh, the transitions go with this uh, 1.2 second release here. Something that sounds like it was recorded in a studio. Now the way that we're doing this is our technology is using a deep learning model. Okay? Yeah! You get it? Super, super easy, so darn effective. Now, mind you, um, this this voice was recorded directly into the iPhone, so that what you're seeing there is kind of its own, um, it does its own sort of auto gain limiting thing. That voiceover is not compressed in and of itself, so, you know, there's some points in my own voice where it just, the nature of the iPhone capture, maybe it's a little lower, if I added a compressor to my own voice, it would be that much more even. But you can absolutely hear very dynamically how it's adjusting the volumes over time. Take a listen to this section here. It's trained to learn the transformation from pairs of training data, like laptop and cell phone recordings and corresponding studio recordings. Now, of course, you're thinking to yourself, does this AI get it right every time so that you're... I mean, God, it's so musical. This, this SSA is so musical. Love this effect. I don't work for Waves, I don't get it free, I have to buy it like everybody else. It's awesome. Okay, for, for this kind of stuff especially. Okay, so that's doing it with a third party effect. Any questions on that? Where do you see keyframes in multi-track? Uh, as I showed you, for automation, you see them by twirling down the automation lanes and then you can choose you know, if you want keyframes for volume, that's the one you're seeing there. For your track EQ settings, for your send outputs level, all of these things. Here, I'll zoom in so you can see those. So again, if you're wanting to modify your send level to the side chain, you can do that here. You can also on and off the side chain uh, and then all these other settings as well, okay? And then all of those will appear in those automation lanes. Okay. Um, so that's using the SSL one. Let me just show you instead our native one. Now, the only effect, the only compressor that we have uh, that you can use for sidechain ducking is our Dynamics processor. And as I've told you many, many times, this is this is the oldest audition effect. It's been in it's been in there since Cool Edit, definitely Cool Edit 1.0, I think. I'm going back so far. Definitely cool at 1.2. I can't. I actually can't remember before that, but um, it's been in. It's been in there 20 plus years. We've made some modifications to the UI. It it sounds wonderful. It's just not the easiest compressor to set because it doesn't have sort of the standard controls. Also, as I've said many times, I just despise this graph. I don't. I just don't like this. This is a gain reduction meter here. That's my personal preference. It sounds great you should use it. 
here's a way to use it easily for ducking. So fortunately, we have a lot of uh, we have a lot of good presets in here, many of which I made, uh, you know, 100 years ago. Let's go ahead and just choose this broadcast limiter preset, okay? And again, probably the only thing that we're going to have to adjust here are the release times. So in this, this is also where this effect gets confusing because we have separate, separate level detectors and gain processor. You just saw we were using a 1.2 second release, um, 300 millisecond, that's gonna be that's going to be what we call pumping and breathing. That's way too fast. And the gain processor is one millisecond. So this is probably going to sound like a mess um, in its <laughs> in its initial uh, initial stage. We also may need to send more of it to the uh, to the gain processor. But let's let's take a listen in here, and I'll show you how we can just make a quick modification, then use this for ducking. Here we go. Hey TikTok, Jason Levine from Adobe here. Let's talk about Project Shasta. So Project Shasta has three specific components. We're gonna focus solely on the one called- Oh, sorry, I didn't turn the side chain on. Duh. Okay, side chain, mono, side chain, dynamics processor. Okay, here we go. Hey TikTok, Jason Levine from Adobe here. Let's talk about Project Shasta. So Project Shasta has three specific components. We're gonna focus solely on the one called Enhanced Speech. And the idea behind this is maybe you don't have the best sounding mic, or maybe you're not in the best- in Okay, now you hear the music. It sounds like it's angry and it's about to explode on top of you. That's because the release times are too short. <laughs> so let's put both of these to around 900 milliseconds or so. Wind it back, hit play. Hey TikTok, Jason Levine from Adobe here. Let's talk about Project Shasta. So Project Shasta has three specific components. We're gonna focus solely on the one called Enhanced Speech. Okay. Very automated, animated, both of those. So that's side chain ducking, easy. And again, I recommend, you know, using the broadcast limiter, it just sort of works. The, probably the only thing you may need to adjust are release times. Oh, and also, you, maybe the attack time. One millisecond, it, it'll probably sound even a little bit better around, well, let's make it like five, let's see. Hey TikTok, Jason Levine from Adobe here. Let's talk about Project Shasta. So Project Shasta has three specific components. We're gonna focus solely on the one called Enhanced Speech. And the idea behind this is maybe you don't have the best sounding mic, or maybe you're not in the best environment. Yeah, so you see, we're, it, it was clipping a little bit of my of the input, right? It's getting the input signal from the dialogue. So a one millisecond attack time is so fast, it's 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 kicking in a little a little too quickly. So voice, typically again for like broadcast voiceover, uh, I've talked about this when we've talked about compression. If you're doing you know sportscasters. Uh, five to 11 milliseconds attack time. Again, it's a little different for ducking, but one millisecond is usually a little too fast. Somewhere between even five to 18 can be okay. It just depends on sort of the speed of the dialogue and the pacing, but one is typically almost a little too fast. So in this case, the gain processor, it's okay to have that one a little bit longer, but um, for the level detector, how it's detecting that input signal, for voice, you probably want it somewhere between, like I said, five, five and 11 milliseconds, okay? It's like a 90s rave, all you need is the zoom in, zoom out, yes. Hello, Vamboo. All right, Jörg says, awesome. Okay, so my friends, that is sidechain ducking, automation, and busing. For my last number, I can't believe we're actually gonna do this on time, so, Again, Adobe Podcast Enhanced. You can find it by going to podcast.adobe.com. And Podcast Enhance, pause, Podcast Enhance allows you to take audio that isn't so great and make it sound very podcast-like, like all in one. There's no settings yet. It's a beta. It's in the it's in the cloud. It's in the web. I should say, not in the cloud. Um, it's it's a it's a it's a beta, but. You can use this today, and you've probably seen some of this going around social media. It's pretty astounding. And I'll tell you, it tends to work best on stuff that is is not pro-miked. Or, you know, again, maybe it's a lav, but it's like a cheap lav. 
the better your input sound, it tends to almost have um, diminishing uh, effects. The worse your sound, it tends to kind of blow your mind and how good of a job it does. So you can see I spared no expense to record this, me in my backyard a couple weeks ago. And uh, here's the original audio, take a listen. Hi, I'm Jason Levine, and in this demo, I'm gonna show you how we can use... Oh, here, I'm just gonna put a little, uh, a little limiter here just to make this louder for the stream, because that might be just entirely too quiet altogether. So just do a little brick wall limiter on there. Again, just to make it louder for the stream, I'm not affecting the uh, any other uh, element of this. There we go. Margin of two. I got four minutes. Adobe Podcast Enhance to make this outdoor recording with no additional hardware sound that much better. Hi, I'm Jason Levine, and in this video... I'm okay, so you hear what that sounds like. So here's how this works, okay? All I did was I exported just the audio from the camera which I have here outside iPhone Audio-2. I'll just play it for you so you can hear it. Hi, I'm Jason Levine and- Okay, no, no tricks up my sleeve. Okay, let's go over to, oh here, one second. Let me switch my screen for just a second. All right, let's go over to uh, the web. Again, podcast.adobe.com. And if you scroll down, all you have to do is log in with your Adobe ID, by the way. Go to AI Powered Audio, Enhanced Speech, try it out, okay? And it's as simple as drag and drop. And you see we've now increased it. You can have up to 500 megabytes in your file size and one hour max duration per upload. And you can do up to three hours per day. So I'm gonna go to upload here. And I've got that file on the desktop outside phone audio dash two dot wave. You see it right there. Go ahead and open. It's enhancing the speech. Let it do its thing. Two minutes. Is access to podcast still restricted? Yes, for the podcast recording part of it, you still have to get accepted into the beta, um, but this is not. Anyone can use this. Good question, Gino. All right, a lot of... A lot of activity going on, evidently. Here we are. Aha, there we are. Okay. So it's done. It's enhanced. Let's go ahead and download this. And it's downloaded. Okay. Back in Premiere Pro. Let's go into our import here. It's going to show up in downloads. Here it is, outside phone audio enhanced. All right. Let's drag this down into the timeline. Okay. By the way, here, I'll just go into the uh, vertical workspace because it just looks better. Zzzt. All right. So here is the before. Hi, I'm Jason Levine. And in this demo, I'm going to show you how we can use Adobe Podcast in hand. Now, it's not bad, right? It sounds outside. You've got the birds and all that. But I'm like 10 feet away. So it just has that distance thing. Now, let's check out the enhanced audio. Hi, I'm Jason Levine, and in this demo, I'm going to show you how we can use Adobe Podcast Enhance to make this outdoor recording with no additional hardware sound that much better. What? Hi, I'm Jason Levine, and in this video, I'm going to show you how we can use Adobe Podcast Enhance to make the audio sound that much better, even with tons of chirping birds. Okay. I mean... There's really nothing more to say about that. You just have to try it out. Now, did it get rid of all, all the bird stuff? No, there's still some birds there. I am outside, that's fine. And one of the things that I imagine you will see, again, it's still a beta, okay? A lot of people have been talking about this on Reddit and asking for requests, a little slider to put back in some of that room tone, some of the ambience, because stripping it all away, it's almost too clean. It's almost uncanny valley, and it can blow your mind with how good it sounds. So. I put this up against Resolve's voice ISO. This, frankly, this beats that. This has far fewer artifacts than that does. No, no offense to Resolve. It's great. Their voice ISO is good. This just sonically, it sounds better. The artifacting is different. Now, you can have sometimes some weird uh, artifacts for sounds that are not human sounds. So one of the birds was really loud, and this is what it interpreted it as. 
Freaky. But try it out, podcast.adobe.com. My friends, that's the end of our stream for today. So thank you so much for joining me. Have a great rest of your morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are in the world. And we'll see you again next time. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.